After six long months, Payday 3 second DLC chapter, Boys in Blue, has finally dropped. It's been a long content drought since Syntax Era dropped back in December, with no new heists, no new weapons, and not even new outfits being added to the game. This was very obviously because most of Starbreeze's efforts were going towards Operation Medic Bag and the additions and improvements that came along with it, but it's definitely been a rough waiting period. The Boys in Blue DLC chapter is finally here though, bringing with it a heist, a weapon pack, and a tailor pack as well. To start off with, we of course had to talk about the Boys in Blue heist itself. Boys in Blue has the Payday Gang hitting a police station for Vlad, as the cops had seized gold from one of his actually legitimate businesses, and he wants that gold back by any means necessary. Like most of Payday 3's heists, Boys in Blue is playable in both stealth and in loud. I can't really say too much on the heist in stealth as I'm not a huge stealth player, though from how I see it, it's nothing extremely interesting nor is it extremely boring, just an overall solid addition. Loud, on the other hand, gets very creative with how it plays. I have quite a lot to say about the heist, and unfortunately, it's not all positive. First and foremost, it is a fun heist. Fighting cops at police station is always a recipe for a good time, and the addition of gold as a loot type was nice to see. Like usual, Gustavo cooked on the music. I'm not really a big music critic or whatever, but it just sounds really good. The objectives are very solid, while having very clear-cut purposes and you can even get some of the objectives done early to make your life easier, like getting the car keys in loud before you need to escape, and it's great, because it rewards map and heist knowledge. Most importantly though, there are no circle objectives, we are so back. I also appreciate that Loud and Stealth primarily take place in two different sections of the police station, with Stealth's objectives being primarily within the confines of the station itself, and Loud being around the car park in the garage. It felt a little bit weird at first, but after thinking about it for a while, I realised that it's actually a good thing for the heist, as it makes Stealth and Loud feel very palpably different, and it makes repeated playthroughs feel less repetitive if you're rotating between Stealth and Loud. I do wish though that there was a little bit more loot in the evidence lockup room, as six bags of gold and four bags of other miscellaneous stuff just feels really underwhelming. I think there's definitely a good amount of gold, having to carry six bags is quite taxing with the movement penalties it applies, but just having some extra loot would be interesting. The big issue I have with the heist though is how the map is designed for loud. In the background footage you're watching, I'm playing this heist on Overkill, currently the game's highest difficulty, and I won't lie, this heist is pretty rough. However, what I noticed is that a lot of what makes this heist difficult in particular is because of issues present in previous heists that are generally considered to be bad, yet they're repeated again. A lot of the heist in Loud takes place in the police station's car park, which should be a phrase that's already setting the alarm bells off in people's heads. Car parks are, very notably, open spaces, given that they have to have space for cars to drive around in of course, meaning that your main cover is going to be the cars parked there. You have cars of all different shapes and sizes in it, which can give you protection, but more often than not, you're going to be open from a lot more angles than I figure most people would be comfortable with, and open on much longer sight lines than I figure most people would be comfortable with too. I will admit, it's better in the garage as you have tyres, tool trolleys, and some other thingy with doodads I don't quite know the technical names of in there that you can use as cover, but still, you have a lot of angles where cops can take shots at you. With the space you play around in, the heist is oddly reminiscent of Border Crossing and Payday 2, which I should mention, is definitely something not to be taken positively. Then, there's the objectives themselves, which aren't too bad all things considered, with them usually being put in areas where there's a decent amount of cover to work with, like the garage or the gated area to the side of it. What's important to note though is that, despite the difficulty imposed by the rather unfortunate map design of the heist, it's still very much completable. My actual main concern with the design though has to do with balance. Yeah, I'm acutely aware I sound a bit like a crackpot conspiracy theorist here, but just hear me out. If the heist has this rough area to play around in, even with the adaptive armor and fortitude, requiring you to play decently aggressively to make sure you don't get torn into a million pieces, what exactly does this mean for the game? Are we going to see heist balance around the adaptive armor and fortitude, where they're challenging because players need to be constantly maintaining aggressive positions throughout them? I hope not, because I think we'll essentially put the game into a spot where they really wouldn't be able to rework the adaptive armor or fortitude into being balanced additions, as they're still incredibly overpowered in comparison to the traditional armors and on the original heists. After all, if the heists that continue to release are designed around the adaptive armor and fortitude right now, it'll essentially lock them into never changing that, as so much of the game would be balanced around how they play currently. There's definitely a lot of room for me to be wrong in talking complete gibberish though, as I am aware that level design and game balance most certainly have two different groups of people working on it, but I think it's something that Starbreeze really needs to keep in mind as we continue to get new heists. Moving on from that massive tangent, the lighting effects in the heist are really distracting. Moving out from the vault area back into the car park is horrible, and it feels like you're fighting more against the lighting rather than the cops themselves. The trading phase before the first assault starts on Boys in Blue is also just really hard to make use of, and it seems to be an unintentional oversight, as there's just so many cops within the station that fire at you, causing negotiations to end and the assault to start instantly. 
Granted, the first objective in Loud is causing a big explosion to happen, which I'm sure would cause the assault to start anyway, but it's definitely annoying and it takes away from the hostage trade skills, which I'm sure would be excellent on this heist, as I'd let you buy yourself some time to get the car keys and work on getting the garage open before having to fight the cops. Overall though, Boys in Blue is a really fun heist, despite being sort of weirdly made in some parts. The Boys in Blue weapon pack comes with three weapons, the ATK-7, Adelig RG-5 and the Bullkick 500. The ATK-7 is an SMG, and as far as SMGs go, it's pretty good. It's got good spread, got good recoil, and a great rate of fire, making an excellent pick for whenever you want a close quarters high rate of fire killing machine. It definitely starts to suffer once you start to match up against heavy swats and shields, but it still manages, just requiring more sustained fire in order to kill them. The Adelig RG-5 is an assault rifle, bolstering high damage, similar to that of the VF-7S. It's a very solid gun, but in that lies my issue with it, being that with the addition of the Adelig, there's no reason to really use the VF anymore, as the gun's practically a straight upgrade to it. The gun handles better, it's got better spread, and most importantly, the gun has a crazy forgiving ammo pickup amount. On the VF, you have to be accurate in hitting your shots, really making use of the one-shot headshots you can get with it to maintain your ammo. With the Adelig though, it just feels like you can spam it and you won't even run the risk of going negative. It should be worth noting as well that I've been playing around with the gun in solo, so if it's incredibly self-sufficient in solo where you'll be the one making most of the kills and using up all of your ammo, I dread to think how brain dead the gun is in multiplayer. The Bull Kick 500 is the revolver added in the pack, and the name does not lie. This thing kicks like a bull, but makes up for it with some extreme damage, being able to one-shot body shot even heavy swats as long as you have edge active, and yeah, it's about as crazy as it sounds. You won't get much usage out of it at range given how absolutely wide its spread is, but in close quarters, this thing is absolutely devastating. I've seen some concerns about the gun from a power creep perspective, in that what purpose do the Castigo and Bison have if there's this new revolver that can just one-shot body shot? As much as I understand where they're coming from, I'd have to disagree. The Castigo has sadly fallen off with the removal of cutting shot, RIP, gone but not forgotten, but it and the Bison are incredibly good at taking out enemies at a variety of distances, while the Bull Kick is great for close quarters and is absolutely horrid at anything outside of that. Moving on from their technical sides, you have the models and the animations of the guns, and yeah, they're cool. The gun models look great, the animations are incredibly smooth, no complaints from me on that front. Last but not least, the Boys in Blue Tailor Pack comes with the usual amount of cosmetics. Four masks, four outfits, and four gloves. For masks, there's Clown Punk, Mad Mask Raider, Killer K9, and Clowninator. I've never really been a huge fan of the additional masks in the Payday games, always preferring the Heister defaults, but these are pretty cool as far as masks go. For outfits, there's Jailbird, Flight Risk, Riotcon, and Supermax. I actually really like these outfits and the literal cops and robbers theme they went with. They look great, and honestly, Supermax might just be my new favourite outfit. Then you have the gloves, Starcut, Suave Grippers, Digiswipe, and Elmers. The gloves are good, having a good range of colours and materials, generally just looking great, as well as fitting quite well with their intended outfits. Overall, the cosmetics in the pack are pretty good. The tailor packs are always hard to review because they're very subjective. An outfit, mask, or pair of gloves I think is absolutely hideous you might think is the best thing ever, and vice versa. Now, the real question. Is the DLC worth the price? This is a pretty important question to ask, as when Syntax Error came out, it was incredibly horrible in terms of value. £15 for a heist, weapon pack and tailor pack in the bundle was overpriced, to put it lightly, and a lot of people, myself included, complained about the pricing at the time. Starbreeze took this criticism pretty well, and thankfully, have actually rethought their pricing strategies for the DLCs and lowered their prices, but is it actually a good deal? The Boys in Blue chapter bundle costs £9.49, including all three of the DLCs, the Heist, the Weapon Pack, and the Tailor Pack. Then, as standalone purchases, the Heist is £6.49, the Weapon Pack £3.29, and the Tailor Pack £2.49. As far as pricing goes, this is actually incredibly solid. If we compare this to Payday 2's final DLC prices, it matches pretty well. For the comparison on its pricing, I'll use Midland Ranch in particular, as it was the last DLC bundle to have one Heist, one Weapon Pack, and one Tailor Pack. The bundle price is increased by £1.06, going from £8.43 to £9.49. The individual highest price has gone up by 50 pence, going from £5.99 to £6.49. The individual weapon pack price has actually decreased though, going down by 10 pence, going down from £3.39 to £3.29. Then, the individual tailor pack price has actually stayed the same, remaining steadfast at £2.49. Of course, the specifics on numbers will change depending on what currency you're purchasing it with, but the general message to take away from it is that prices are down compared to the Syntax Zero DLC and are more in line with Payday 2's DLC pricing. If my almost overwhelmingly positive feedback of the DLC's content alongside its pricing wasn't obvious enough as to what my answer is, yes, the DLCs are very much worth your purchase. 
That's about it, though. If you like me and bought either the silver or gold editions of the game, you get the DLC bundle for free. As usual, though, I've been Cookie Dough, and have a good one.